here. My name is Jesse Romero. Just a little bit about me. I'm a retired Los Angeles deputy sheriff. I worked for 25 years for the largest sheriff's department in the world. I loved my job. Took a lot of people to jail. Um, I also uh, boxed competitively for about 10 years from 1983 to 1993. A lot of my fights are on YouTube, if you don't believe me. Uh, I had 64 fights in the ring. I was uh, 160, lost four by decision. Never been knocked out. So people ask me, so how does it feel? You're a boxer for 10 years? Yeah. How does it feel to get knocked out? I said, I don't know. I see the guy. I knocked about half the guys that I boxed. Knocked them out. I don't know how it feels to get knocked out, but other guys know how it feels to get knocked out. Fuck. All my four losses were by decision. Um, when I retired from the sheriff's department, I had fallen in love with Jesus as a young guy, as a young cop, street cop, and, and uh, I, just, I just said, you know what? I can work 30 or 40 years in the sheriff's department. I, 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 I said, I've had enough. And uh, I put up a website, made some business cards, and uh, I just started preaching the gospel. And people said, hey, you got a knack, you have a, you have a real knack to preach. I went back to school, got my master's degree in biblical theology, lived with Scott Hahn for about three summers. He's probably the greatest Bible teacher in the world. And I got to live with him. And uh, not only study from him, but also live with him. And so I kept in contact with him uh, for the last 12 years. 15 years. He's, he's again, he's the greatest Catholic Bible study teacher in the world, and I have access to all his data. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the suit of the doctor that got on, and now I've been preaching the Catholic gospel since I retired from the sheriff's department in Spanish and in English, and I'm trying to help Catholics fall in love with Jesus, know their faith, and get to heaven. It's that simple. That's simple. Okay? That's, uh, I, have, I, I got, I'm focused on just uh, trying to help Catholics be better Catholics. I say, I want to help bad Catholics be good Catholics, and I want to help good Catholics be better Catholics, and I want to help better Catholics be saints. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's look at the Bible. That's what we're going to go through tonight. Mark chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, I have it up here. Okay. He, this is Jesus speaking, he also said to them, Amen, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come in power. Okay, so what's Jesus Christ? Jesus is talking to the 12 apostles here. Now, Jesus, who is the Son of God, and knows everything. He knows what's, what's going to happen to him in a few weeks. He knows that he's going to be arrested. He's going to be charged with the crime of blasphemy and sedition, which means to be a political uh, revolutionary against the Roman Empire. He knows he's going to be put to death, but Jesus Christ actually came into the world to die. He came to die for our sins. That was his mission. So it wasn't a surprise, but still in his human nature, it didn't pain him as he sees this is what is going to happen to me. He saw the details of the passion. When you saw the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion, he knew all that, and yet he still chose to do that, to die for our sin. Why? Hebrews 9.22 says this. Hebrews 9, 22 says, uh, I want to quote it perfectly. Somebody open up Hebrews 9, 22. Now, here's it. It says, for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9, 22. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. In other words, for us to get to heaven because we're sinners, that a sinner can't get to heaven. Somebody has to pay the price. That's what he did. Because none of us is holy enough to pay the price for our own sin. We're all sinners. We don't have the sufficient capacity of holiness within our soul to please a holy God. There's only one person that's sufficiently holy to be the perfect sacrifice to satisfy the holy judgment of God. God's judgment, the Father's judgment, can only be satisfied by the Son's sacrifice. Because the Father is holy, perfectly holy, and the Son is perfectly holy, and I'm not. I'm a sinner. What do sinners need? They need a Savior. That's the whole reason why Jesus came from heaven and became a man and died for our sins. That's what he's talking about there. He's telling the apostles that he's going to have to taste death. Okay? But he's also saying that the generation of Jews that put him to death, they're also going to taste death. That's what he's saying in verse, in verse uh, 1. Verse 2. 
after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Peter, of, of Jesus' 12 apostles, those three were his inner circle. They were his favorites. They were his inner circle. He would confide everything to those three amongst the 12 that he chose. And led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. What does the word transfigure mean? It's a Greek word. Here's what Jesus Christ did. He went up to a mountain. Now Peter, James, and John are looking at him, and he says, okay, you guys want to know who I really am? This is what he did. The Greek word is metamorpho. He went like this. He opened himself up, and he showed Peter, James, and Sean, John that he was God. All they saw was a million sunlights bursting from Jesus Christ, and they knew immediately, this is God in a human body. That's what it means. He transfigured. He, he literally opened himself up and said, Peter, James, John, this is who I am. And he closed himself. <clears throat> Look at what it says in verse 3. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Here's something very interesting. We as Catholics get so oftentimes criticized by Protestants. You guys pray to the saints. The only thing, when you pray to the saints, that the word pray in Greek means ask. Yeah, I do ask the saints to pray for me because they're in heaven. The word pray means ask. That's what it means, okay? It actually has two definitions. If you look at Webster's, pray means either to adore or worship. So definition number one, when we pray to God, we adore and worship God. Definition number two, it says to ask or to, or to uh, supplicate somebody or to petition somebody. When we pray to Mary the saints, that's definition number two. We ask them. We, 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 we entreat them. We supplicate them. And by the way, I want to just do something to help you guys out. I want, on my website, I put out a free book. I, I was going to publish it, but I said, I'm just going to give it to people. I probably spent the last 15 years, people ask me questions, Protestants, and I answer their questions with the Bible. And what I do, I started saving those emails. So what I did, I, I said, well, I've got like hundreds of questions that I've answered. So I compartmentalized them. I've got a PDF file on my website on the front page. It's, it's a free book. It's called um, Protestant Questions. Catholic replies by Jesse Romero. So any question that a Protestant will ask you about the saints, if you look at my chapter on my PDF on the saints, I answer all their questions with the Bible. Anything they ask you about Mary, I answer everything a Protestant will ask you for the Bible. It's a free book on my website, jesseromero.com. It's on the front page. It says free PDF download. So it's a free book. I'm telling you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to brag. It's, it's, I got, I got stuff there that you've never seen anybody write. I got some of the best arguments. I've been working on this for like 15 years. And I was going to publish it. I said, I'm just going to give it away for free. I put a lot of stuff because I've debated pastors before. I've debated six pastors, you know, go to a big auditorium, podium, podium, lights, camera, thousand people, Baptist, myself. I've debated pastors. A lot of my arguments I put in that book to show you how to share the faith. Question? You know what? Can you translate it? <laughs> yeah, somebody translated it for me in Spanish, and I'll put it in Spanish. In fact, you know what? I'll look for a translator. So I got some people saying, hey, I want it in Spanish. So I'll make sure there's a lot of people that are, that are asking me. So uh, it'll probably take about two months. But it's in English now. But I may, I'll make sure I translate it in Spanish. I promise. Okay? All right. Uh, so verse 4, look at Elijah, who is no longer a planet earth. Elijah was taken... Uh, up to up to the presence of God about 700 years before Christ's body and soul. So Elijah never died. Elijah never actually died. Now, what's the Catholic tradition? The Catholic tradition is that you probably never heard this. This is old Catholic tradition. I can say it. a lot of priests don't even know it unless you read the old Catholic literature. The church teaches the, the old, like 1,900 years of Catholicism. The last 50 years, they've forgotten this. The church has always taught that before the Antichrist comes into the world, the man of sin, 
the, the, the man of lawlessness who's going to try to erect a one world government and who's going to persecute the church, we're going to be told who the Antichrist is. By who? Elijah will come back to earth. Why? Elijah never died. Everybody has to die before you get to heaven. So the Catholic popes and saints have said that Elijah is in some type of room in, 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 the, in, in, in the cosmos, but he's not in the presence of God because he hasn't physically died yet. The church teaches that he will come back to earth, he will warn us who the Antichrist is, and then they will kill him in Jerusalem, and he will die just like Jesus. Then he will go to heaven. Now look at the other person in verse 4. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, uh, and they were conversing with Jesus. Moses died. We don't know where his grave is at. The Jews don't know where his grave is at, but he already he passed away about 1,300 years before Christ. So notice, you have two saints that are gone. They're no longer on planet Earth. They appear to Jesus, and Jesus talks to them. So when a Protestant tells me, why do you pray to saints? I say, you don't pray to me. That means we're talking to them and just asking them for, for, uh, to pray for us. I said, so you're saying that we shouldn't be talking to saints? No, you should never be talking to saints. I said, really? Then why does Jesus talk to dead saints? Jesus. So I'm just following, I as a Catholic, I'm just following Jesus. Protestants say, don't talk to dead saints. I'm saying, okay. What did Jesus do in chapter 9, verse 4? Those two people were dead. They're no longer on planet Earth. What, what, what was that for sure? Moses. And so Jesus is talking to them. So as Catholics, Jesus is the one that shows us by example that we do continue to have this relationship with the dead that are in God's grace. Verse 5. Then Peter said to Jesus and replied, That might. It is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say. They were so terrified. In other words, Peter was so happy with what he saw. He said, wow, Jesus is God. He just showed who he is. Peter, uh, uh, Elijah, Moses come from outer space. Elijah from outer space, wherever he's at. Moses from heaven. And there's, there's, Peter came to God and said, man, I, just want, I don't want to leave this place. They're having a mountaintop experience. And they're saying, I don't want to go back to the, the depressing valley. Let's make tents and stay here. And Jesus is saying, no, I can't do that. Verse 7. Uh, then a cloud came casting a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice. So this is God the Father. In the Bible, you'll see God the Father. He appears a lot like a cloud. And the Jews call the cloud that God appears as the Jews call it Shekinah. Say Shekinah. Shekinah. That's Hebrew. That means the glory presence of God. God usually shows himself as a cloud. The, the Jews call that cloud the Shekinah. It means the glory presence of God. That's what's happening here. Then a cloud came, the Shekinah, casting a shadow over them. Then from the cloud, the Shekinah, came a voice. Who's the voice? The God the Father, the first version of the Blessed Trinity. What does he say? He says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. So God the Father is validating Jesus of Nazareth in front of all the people and saying, that's my son. Technically speaking, God only has one son. Some people say, no, just you're the son of God. Well, let me correct you. Romans chapter 8, the Bible says that all of us through baptism are adopted, adopted, adopted. None of us is a son of God by nature. We're sinners. We're human beings. We're not divine. At baptism, God adopts us into his family. The only person that's God's son by nature is Jesus of Nazareth. Only Jesus <coughs> shares divinity with the Father. Verse 8. Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus alone with them. As they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them not to relate what they had seen to anyone except when the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is what scholars call the messianic secret. Jesus Christ, when he does something miraculous, he tells the people, don't tell anybody. Why does he say that? Because the Jews then and the Jews today still must understand who Jesus is. The Jews are waiting for the Messiah, the Savior that's going to come from heaven, that, that Yahweh is going to send from heaven to save them. 
But the Jews look at the Messiah as a political figure, as a warlord, as another King David who will come and raise up a mighty Israeli army and defeat the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, and become a world power. That's not our definition of the Messiah. We don't look at this politically or through the eyes of a military man. For us, the Messiah, as Christians, and that's a Jewish Catholic debate. The Messiah for us, we don't want salvation from Russia or China or some communism or, or we want salvation from hell. We want salvation from our sin. For us, the Messiah means the savior of our soul. So that's the debate that Catholics and Jews have had for 2,000 years. Their view of the Messiah is more political Messiah, a warlord. And that's why when Jesus Christ does a miracle in front of the Jews, he always says, don't tell anybody. Why? Because the Jews want to run and say, guess what? The Messiah is here. But their interpretation of the Messiah is different from ours. Ours is a, a savior of our soul, a savior from hell. Their interpretation is political. He's going to be a great mighty king like King David. He's going to have white horses and chariots and swords and spears and scimitars and, and shields and, and 10,000 soldiers, you know. Uh, they look at Messiah as political. Jesus doesn't want them to tell everybody about the miracle because he knows the Jews are going to come and grab him and throw him up on their shoulders and put a crown on him saying, Okay, Jesus, let's beat up Rome. Because the Jews are still blinded and they think that they don't need salvation from hell. They're, they're more, we need salvation from our political enemies. Verse 10. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. Then they asked them, why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He told them, Elijah will indeed come first and restore all things. Yet how is it writ written regarding the Son of Man that he must suffer greatly and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Next. Verse 14. When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the scribes arguing with them. Okay, let me define two terms. What does disciple mean? The, the word disciple is a Greek word, which means student. That's what the word is. Methetes in Greek means a student of Jesus, a student of Master. Apostle means, it's a different Greek word, apostolos means one who was sent with the authority of the one sending them. In order to be an apostle, you have to be an eyewitness to the resurrection and to the life of Christ. So none of us in this room are apostles. We are disciples. We're students of Jesus, students of the Master, followers of Him. An apostle is an actual eyewitness of the events that happened in the New Testament. So that's very limited to those people that are written in the biblical documents. Uh, who are the scribes? The scribes are the Jewish lawyers. They're the, they're the ones, they're the Jewish establishment. The Jews, politics and religion wasn't separated in America. We separate, that's a, by the way, that's not a Catholic idea. That's a Masonic, that came from the Freemasons. Separate uh, politics and religion. Catholicism interfaces both. It always did for thousands of years. And the Catholic Church ran the best countries and the greatest era known to man called the Holy Roman Empire. The Jews, they also did not separate religion and politics. The Pharisees and Sadducees were the religious leaders and the political leaders in one office. Verse 15. Immediately on seeing him, the whole crowd was utterly amazed. They ran up to him and greeted him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I have brought to you my possess, my son possessed by a mute spirit. Okay? So what is possession? Possession of a demon is when a demon attaches itself to your body. A demon can never attach itself to your soul or penetrate the soul. The soul is a sanctuary where you and God commune and converse. In possession, in full possession, a demon can attach itself inside your body. The marks of demonic possession, according to the Catholic Church, are the person is very strong. The possessed person becomes very strong. The church calls that preternatural strength. The possessed person version has aversion to holy objects. Uh, they, they get nauseous in the presence of holy objects. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, about a year ago, I was doing a Bible study in here, 
Uh, and there's probably about three times more. Uh, the whole back of the church was almost full. A possessed person walked in from the street, went to the back, and they stood there. They were listening to me. Then we turned off the lights and started praying, and all of a sudden, this person started screaming like an animal. And I walked back there, and he's on the floor, and he's on his stomach like a snake, and he's, uh, and he's convulsing, and his face is in a trance. And uh, we ended up uh, praying over him for about 20 minutes. I ended up talking to him outside after everybody left. I stood outside. That was kind of dumb of me. I think about it. Why was I talking to, by myself with this guy? You know, by myself. So we were on the patio. Uh, I think we finished out at like 9.30. I was out there with him until 11.30. And he told me everything. And I said, what? You know, he gave me the emphasis. So what happened? And he goes, Jesse said, uh, I'm seeing an exorcist. And I've been through 11 exorcisms. He's been doing exorcisms for, for me, over me, every month for about the last year and a half. I said, so why do you come over here with my Bible study? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, he, because I was talking about spiritual warfare, he goes, I saw somebody sent me on Facebook that you were talking about spiritual warfare, and I just want to learn more about this thing that's inside my body. So, uh, yeah, that was, okay, verse uh, 18. What, wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. So a possessed, a, a demon can throw you physically down. They try to torment you. Uh, they try to uh, torment the human body, so they will throw you down. Look what else it says. Uh, he foams at the mouth. That's another thing that you'll see in possession. A person, you'll start seeing, they start foaming at the mouth. It says, grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. That's, that's classic signs of possession. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they were unable to. The word driving out a demon is the word exorcism. Exorcism means to drive out a demon. Verse 19. He said to them in reply, this is Jesus, he said to them in reply, O faithful generation, how long will, will I be with you? How long will I endure you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him, to Jesus, and when he saw him, the spirit immediately threw the boy into convulsions. As he fell to the ground, he began to roll around and foam at the mouth. Here's one of the things that you'll see. A person who's possessed and they're becoming healed, and I just know this because I sat, I probably sat in about 50 exorcisms. I was on an exorcism team for many years in Los Angeles. When the demons, demons, because demons never attack by themselves, they always attack in packs. They're like gang members. It's never only one. There's always inferior demons and superior demons. But here's what happens when they're being healed. The demon will throw the person to the ground, and then the priest will tell you, let them go, let them go. Wherever you just pray very quietly, the person will start convulsing for about a minute or two. It looks like a seizure. And that's a sign that the demons are leaving. When the person at the very end starts convulsing on the ground, the demons are leaving the body. It's painful. The people will tell you after the demons are gone. How did it feel? It's, it's the most painful. It's like getting shot. It's like somebody sticking you with, with hot poker sticks as the demons are leaving the body. You can see the persons are in pain. But you'll also see that when a person's possessed, their face goes into a trance. It goes into a trance. And so now you have a, a possessed person. You'll have the person is trying to fight the demon with his personality, and the demon overlays his character, his personality, takes over the voice box, takes over the body. And so a good priest that's very trained well, he'll do this. Like if the guy in front of me's name's Ralph. The priest is praying, he's got the team around him, he's holding the person down, and the priest wants him. And a good priest that's trained, he'll say, you know, as he's praying, you know, the, the, the prayers over the, over the possessed, then he'll say, Ralph, Ralph, are you with me? Ralph, can you hear me? How do, do you feel better? It, what, are, what, what should I pray? Uh, how many are there? And then Ralph will talk to the priest, Father, help me, keep praying, don't stop, Father. There's 12 of them, Father, please, it hurts, it hurts. And then the demon will take over. The demon will say, he's not. You can't. The other voice, face changes, gets dark, eyes get black. You can't have him. He's mine. He's mine. Ah, ah, ah. You're wasting your time. So a priest is literally back. It's like a chess game. A priest is in one minute talking to the demon, trying to drive him out. And then the next minute talking to the patient, to the victim, saying, Ralph, are you okay? Are you with me? Ralph, you need a bottle of water. Ralph, take a breath. Take a breath. We're here. We're not going anywhere. We're, we're here. How do you feel? Well, talk to me. So it's a battle because in possession, the demon comes in and out. And sometimes the priest is talking to the demon. Sometimes it's the, it's the patient. Verse uh, 20, uh, 21. 
Then he questioned his father, how long has this been happening to him? He replied, since childhood. It has often thrown him into the fire and into water to kill him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Verse 21 is very interesting. The goal of a demon is to kill you. That's the end game. Like you talked about, okay, so what's the end game? We're in war, we're in a football game. The end game of a demon is to try to get every human being to kill themselves. That's, that's, what the, that's their purpose, is to get you to fall into despair. And that's, but it doesn't mean, by the way, there are, there's a lot of people that do commit suicide, but the Catholic Church is very, very clear about saying that a lot of people that commit suicide, a lot of them do it through no fault of their own. There could be men, depression, acute depression, acute uh, mental illness, uh, acute anxiety and stress. Uh, some of it could be diabolical. And so the Catholic Church said that even a person that commits suicide, God, at the moment that that person is dying, God will appear to them and tell that person that's dying as their soul is leaving their body, God will appear to them and say three times to them, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? So even in the most egregious cases, God reaches the soul and gives them an opportunity to repent. So for us, objectively, like it doesn't look bad. We, it doesn't look good. We say, man, it doesn't look good what Cousin Willie did. But we don't know what happened when Christ met them and what they said. And that's when we continue to pray for them afterwards because our prayers, even in the future, 10, 20, 50 years from now, because God is outside of time, God will take your prayers that you're praying right now in 2020 for somebody in your family that killed themselves in 1950, and God knew you were going to say these prayers in 2020. He will take those prayers and he will bring them back retroactively to 1950 to the moment that your family member was killing themselves. And God in those prayers will give your family member that grace to say yes to Jesus. So don't ever stop praying for the dead because God takes those prayers and brings them back retroactively because God is outside of time. Verse 23, Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible to one who has faith. Then the boy's father cried out, I do believe, help my unbelief. Jesus, on seeing a crowd rapidly gathering, rebuked the unclean spirit. He said to him, mute deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Notice what the Bible calls demons, unclean spirits. What do, what do demons look for? This is very simple, okay? Demons are unclean spirits. They try to find unclean people. So you got to ask yourself, even in your house, do you have things that you probably shouldn't have? You know? Do you have, I don't know, a box of old pornography stuff in the attic somewhere? Do you got Aztec calendars? Do you got uh, Buddha statues? Do you got stuff from, uh, you know, uh, Santa Muerte picture? Do you have uh, an old Playboy magazine or Playgirl magazine somewhere? Do you have, uh, you know, a little cute statue that somebody gave you of a Hindu god? Do you have uh, the Harry Potter series? If you have things that are unclean in your house, they attract demons. Demons are attracted to unclean things and unclean persons. There's a lot of people that I help out. I get called all over the United States. I help out exorcists, and they say, Jess, this is happening in my house. Things are moving, doors are closing, uh, you know, uh, windows don't open at night. Uh, my kids see, see shadow people. So I'm on the phone, I say, okay, let's go through each room of your house. What do you have in here? On well, that room, I got a Buddha statue, throw it out. Okay, let's go to the next room. What do you have in this room? Oh, in this room, I've got, uh, I got these things I got from, from Hawaii, these tiki statues, I said, throw them out. Okay, what do you got in this room? In this room, uh, I've got the, uh, this book, oh, right, somebody gave it to me. It's called a book on, uh, you know, how to cast spells. Throw it out, okay? So I'll go through the house, okay, and start saying these prayers. And they call me back in a week. They call me back in a week. They say, Jess, no more shadow people. No more noises at night. Doors aren't closing. Doors aren't, windows aren't opening. Things aren't moving. Uh, kids aren't seeing uh, things at night. No more nightmares. It's gone. You have to clean your house from everything that will attract an evil spirit. Evil spirits are unclean spirits. 
they're attracted to unclean things, and they're also attracted to unclean people. If you live an unclean life, or you're doing stuff, I, I don't want to get too personal, but even in your sexual practices, okay, if you've been with your wife, are you doing things that are fundamentally unclean? And I don't have to get graphic here, okay? Even in your in your intimacy, you have to be clean. You can't copy the world and do what the world does. You know, uh, those things attract evil spirits. Uh, verse uh, with, uh, 23. 20, 23. 23. 25. Jesus, on seeing a crowd rapidly gathered, rebuked the unclean spirit and said to him, You dead spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. Shouting and throwing the boy into the convulsions, it came out. He became like a corpse, which caused many to say he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, raised him, and he stood up. When he entered the house, the disciples asked him in private, Why can we not drive it out? He said to them, This kind can only come out through prayer. Okay? Which, uh, they, left it. they left from there and began a journey through Galilee, but he did not wish anyone to know about it. He was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be handed over to men, and they will kill him. And three days after his death, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to question him. So Jesus Christ performs miracles, and they like that to see wow, Look at the power that he has. But then he tells the apostles, by the way, I've got to die. But don't worry, I'm going to rise from the dead in three days. You're saying, what? What are you talking about? No, no. They don't want to accept the fact that his mission was to die first on the cross. They just want to see the miracles and the healings and his power. They want it to, that continue, to continue forever and ever. For you? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so Jesus Christ did perform the miracles and healings to increase our faith in him so that when he died for us on a cross, people would say, okay, I saw him raise people from the dead. He promised that he would come back from the dead in three days. I believe him. In other words, even when he died for our sins on the cross, because of the miracles that he performed and the healings and the exorcisms, people said, you know what? I believe what he said, that he will rise from the dead. If anybody can do it, he can do it. Next chapter. Chapter 10. Oh, 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 okay. It's the same. Okay. okay, okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. They came to Capernaum, and once inside the house, he began to ask them, What were you arguing about on the way? And they remained silent. They had been discussing among themselves on the way who was the greatest. Then he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone wishes to be the first, he shall be the last of all and the servant of all. Taking the child, he placed it in their midst, and putting his arms around it, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child as this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives it not, not me, but the one who sent me. Hold it right there. Two things happening here. Jesus is calling us to a life of humility. That's hard, especially for men. It's hard. Yeah. But, but it's something that, that's what he's calling us to. You know, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. It's a life of humility, which is very difficult because we live in a society where, you know, uh, pride is, 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 you know, you even have cities that have things called gay pride. Okay? Pride! 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 The word pride, that identifies the devil. The devil was thrown out of heaven. He was Lucifer, a good angel. He was thrown out of heaven because he manifested the sin of pride. He wanted to be like God. He wasn't happy to be the greatest angel God ever created. He became so full of himself, so much hubris and narcissism, he wanted to be like God. So, this is why pride is dangerous, because pride makes you an imitation of Satan. <laughs> Humility makes you an imitation of Jesus and Mary. Also, one more thing there. See that little boy that Jesus Christ, in verse 35, he takes the little boy, and he places the little boy in the midst of you, and he tells the apostles, hey, apostles, you want to get to heaven, you got to be like this boy. That little boy, his story records, his name was uh, Ignatius. He was of, of, of the city of Antioch in Syria. That little boy was probably about 10 years old. And Jesus says, you, you apostles want to get to heaven, you men? You got to have faith like this child. That little boy became the second Catholic bishop of the city of Antioch in the country of Syria. He was one of the greatest Catholic bishops in the early church. He was killed in 107 AD, Bishop Ignatius of Antioch, that little boy that Jesus took from the crowd, 
He died in the Roman Colosseum for preaching in Syria that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and alive and risen from the dead. He was, uh, he was uh, fed to the lions in 107 AD. He was killed. He was eaten by two lions. And the people that witnessed his death say that when Bishop, Catholic Bishop Ignatius of Antioch, as he was being eaten by the lions, he was singing in their mouth. Witnesses say he was singing in their mouth. What was he singing? Hallelujah. That's Greek and Latin, which means praise the Lord. They can hear his bones just popping in the mouth of the lions as he's in their mouth singing Alleluia, which is something very interesting because that's, that's something that we say a lot as Catholics. And mark my words, you're going to say, now I know why we say that. The first word that you're going to listen to when you enter heaven, I hope that all of us make it to heaven. If we make it to heaven, the first word when you enter from this world into heaven, Revelation chapter 19 says, the first words that everybody's going to hear is Alleluia. Is Peter going to be at the gates with the lips? <laughs> we'll find out. I mean, that's that kind of a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a pious tradition, but it's not a scripture. It's just a kind of a pious Catholic tradition. Okay. Well, this is, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we try to prevent him because he does not follow us. Jesus replied, Do not prevent him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can at the same time speak ill of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ, amen, I say to you, will surely not lose his reward. So back to the first century, the apostles were kind of jealous of Jesus. They're saying, come on, you picked us, and you gave us the power to drive out demons, the power of exorcism. They tell Jesus, there's these other group of guys. They're driving out demons in your name. They're kind of jealous, okay? They say, you didn't pick them. But it goes to show you that even people that were not part of the 12 apostles, the original set of 12, just by praying over people in the name of Jesus, demons recognized the power of that name, and they were driven, driven out by possessed people. Which, by the way, just in case you want to know, every Catholic the church teaches can drive out demons from your body. You can drive out demons. Every Catholic has the power to exercise themselves. Okay, so let me give you the rules of engagement. I exercise myself every night. Every night before I go to bed. I'll sit, and I'll, teach, I'll tell you what I pray, okay? So repeat after me, okay? With my full intellect and will, I reject, rebuke, renounce any evil spirits that may be coming against me. Harassing me, tormenting me. Be gone, be gone. Evil, spirits. evil spirits. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Notice, I just did an exorcism prayer over myself. I have the power to do that over myself. When you do an exorcism prayer over yourself, you have to do it in Jesus' name. Demons only fear when you say in Jesus' name. Okay? The, your body is your temple. That's where God lives. So you have power over your body to cast out evil spirits. A priest has universal power to cast out spirits from all the baptized. And Catholics within the family, mom and dad, have the power to pray and drive out evil spirits from their children. Does too. And here's the difference. And I don't want to get too deep into it. The father has the power to drive out evil spirits from their kids. The Father can say, I, blessed in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I drive out any evil spirits from you. Say your, your son's name or your daughter's name in Jesus' name. The mother, based on the fourth commandment, she can do the same thing, but it's a little bit different. She can't say I because she's not the head of the house. The man is the head of the house, the woman is the heart of the house. This is what Catholic teaches. The man is the head, the woman is the heart of the home. Okay? You need both. You need a head and a heart. The mother, when she prays, she, she has to pray. She has power to drive out evil spirits, but she has to say this. May God, the father says, I. He's, he's the head of God. The father's the icon of God the father. That's Catholic teaching, John Paul II. Okay? The mother is the helpmate, Genesis 2.18, the helper of Adam, which is a military term, by the way, when you look at it in the Hebrew. 
that, that means she's an assistant to a military general. So she had, she had the power to pray over kids, bless her kids, and drive out evil spirits. And mother would say, may God bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may God drive out any evil spirits away from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the mother has to pray. In fact, next year I'm going to teach, uh, next year I'm going to teach just all, anybody who comes here, and I'll put it in the bulletin, I'm going to teach you all healing, deliverance, and minor exorcism for a whole year. That's all I'm going to teach you guys next year. Okay, because there's a lot of interest in the topic. I'm going to go deep into it, give you my notes and stuff. Uh, I'll tell you how powerful a man's prayer is. Here's what I've seen. This one, I'll, I'll get, this one exorcist I was helping out. I'm there. The team is there. We're praying. The possessed person, the patient comes in. He's sitting there. And we're talking. We're trying to calm the person, their fears and stuff at the first session. The priest texted me and says, Jess, he said, I'm about 10 minutes away. I said, no problem, Father. I said, the penitent's here. I said, the team is here. We're praying. Everything is, everything's okay. I put my phone away. The demon started attacking him as he's sitting there in the church. He started growling. He started barking. His, 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 he started uh, getting all tense. His face started becoming dark. I said, oh no. So I told everybody there, I said, Really, very quiet and start praying. Everybody just start praying very softly, softly. Let's start praying the rose of the divine mercy. I get on the phone. I said, Father, I said, the demon is manifesting. I said, how far are you? He goes, I'm stuck in traffic. He goes, is the father there? I said, yeah, the father's right next to me. He goes, get the father to drive off the demon. Are you sure? Get the father to drive him out. I'm stuck in traffic. I said, okay. I said, get over here. There's a Mexican father. I said, come on over here. He's, he's afraid. You see the son. He goes, that's what happened. That's what happened. That's what happened. I said, calm down. I said, don't be afraid. I said, put your right hand over. You're his father. Fourth commandment. Demons have to follow you. Oh, okay, okay, Jesse. I said, repeat after me. Okay? Repeat after me. He put his hand over his head. And I said, repeat after me. By the authority given to me by God the Father as your father, I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if there's any evil spirits in my child, be gone. I order you as his father in Jesus' name. God. The kid went back in his seat. His color returned. He stopped convulsing. He stopped growling. He stopped frothing at the mouth. The exorcist came in about five minutes later. I walked up to him. Told him what happened. He goes, good job. He came over here, sat with him, put holy water on him, put his, put his a crucifix on him, was talking to him, looking at his eyes, praying over him. He looks at the father, he goes, good job, dad, he's healed. The father said, he's a Mexican guy, he said, father, it's me, he goes, no, I, I'm not a priest, it's me, me. He goes, demons listen to Catholic priests because they have authority over all the baptized, and they listen, they have to listen because demons are legal. They listen to the fathers based on the fourth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. Demons have to follow the standard procedure that God has laid out in the universe. And so they know the fourth commandment that the father has the power to bless and to drive out evil spirits. So I've seen this. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Make it quick. No. <laughs> I, I just said okay. Okay, okay. okay. Restricts their activity. In other words, 
uh, they would just scorch the earth if God would allow them to just follow their own desires. They would literally scorch the earth. But God has them on a leash, and God gives them permission as God sees fit. And God gives them permission for the reason, especially like temptation, because God knows our capacity to resist. He knows our faith, the capacity of our faith. And as we resist these divine temptations, we grow in holiness. We become closer to God, grow in holiness. So God will use demons like useful idiots to make us holier because God will give us the sufficient grace to resist these temptations and so to expand our soul in our capacity for love and holiness. Verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to, if a great millstone were put around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than with two hands to go into Gehenna, that's hell, into the unquenchable fire. Stop there. Verse 42 to 44. Does God have favorites? He's got favorites. Or his favorites, kids. I'm just going to tell you this and without getting into too much detail. Anybody who hurts kids and doesn't repent, boy, oh boy, you have no idea what you got coming to you when you face God. God has favorites. They're children. When I see all this human sex slave trafficking, kids and pictures of milk cartons, pedophiles, homosexuals that prey on young people, priests, bishops, uh, I don't care who you are. If you hurt a child and you don't repent and change your life, you literally have hell to pay. If there's one thing that Jesus Christ is going to take his pound of flesh on, it is unrepentant child molesters. There is nothing worse than that according to the Bible. That's the only sin that Jesus Christ speaks out like saying, oh, let me say, whoever causes one of these little ones, talking about children, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him than a great millstone. You know what a millstone is? It's in a hundred pound rock for the Jewish people. hundred pound rock. We're put around his neck and we're thrown into the sea. And it was Jesus is saying, if you kill, if you harm one of these kids, you know what you deserve? The death penalty. So if somebody thinks that Jesus Christ is not the death penalty, you're wrong. Right there, Jesus just said, you heard a kid? Kill yourself. What does it mean when you, you tie a hundred pound rock around your neck and throw yourself over a bridge? Does that mean you go for a swim? That means kill yourself. Because it's going to be better for you to kill yourself than for me to get my hands on you if you hurt one of my kids. And then he says in verse 43, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, and it's better for you to enter into life, in other words, into heaven, eternal life, main than with two hands to go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, it is better for you to enter into life crippled than with two feet to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into Gehenna. Now, from verse uh, 45 to 47, this is what's called hyperbole. What does that mean? Jesus is speaking in an exaggerated manner, but he's making a serious point. In other words, let's just be honest. If that was literal, all of us would be blind because we all sin with our eyeball, every one of us. Especially if you live in California like I did by the beach for 40 some years, okay? You, you sin, okay? So, Jesus is not talking about literally, but he is making a point. Watch your eyes, take custody of your eyes. Don't be lusting for people. Don't be doing deeds with your hands and your feet to hurt people, hurt other people. He's making a very serious point by using hyperbole, saying, cut out your hand, pull out your eye. In other words, he's saying, watch what you do with your body, because with your body, you can offend me by hurting other people. Verse 48, 
where their work, work, where their work does not die and the fire is not quenched. So he's describing hell. Okay, in hell, worms are awful creatures. Hell is so full of worms, according to Jesus, worms don't even die. So you're going to meet people that are in hell are next to live worms. That's awful. And what does also say? And the fire is never quenched. The fires of hell are always lit. Always. They don't stop. Verse 49, everyone will be salted with fire. That sounds painful to me. I don't know about you. Okay? Think about like people, you, you got a wound and, and people say pour salt in the wound. You know, that, that, imagine the pain of hell. Everybody in hell is going to be what's salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt becomes insipid, with what will you restore its flavor? Keep salt in yourselves and you will have peace with one accord. Salt was something that the Jews of the Old Testament, they used to preserve food. They didn't have refrigerators. So everything was packed in salt. That's how you preserved everything back in the days of Christ, before the invention of the refrigerator. Next. Okay, we're not going to finish for a second. We've got five minutes. So we'll just... Uh, there's so much to verse chapter 9. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot to it. I, I, I wanted to try to go faster, but... Yes, what is the question? Couple questions, couple brain go. In the Gospels, it seems like there's a lot of instances where Jesus is healing demonics. We, we don't seem to hear about that much today, or is it just not publicized? It's not publicized. The, every diocese, there's 198 dioceses in the United States. Every diocese has an exorcist, but they don't put their name out because the phones would just go off the hook. And not only that, the reason that exorcist and diocese the bishop doesn't like to put out the name of the exorcist is because Satanists and witches in the neighborhood, what they do when they find out who the exorcist is, they start cursing them by name every night. They take pictures of them and they start doing hexes and curses. And so that's why exorcists and the bishops agree that their name shouldn't be put out there. But what's the way that somebody would see an exorcist? For example, if somebody was possessed in this, in this parish, the first thing that they would do is you'd go and make an appointment with the parish priest, the pastor. Okay, you got two priests here, Father Ben and Father Craig. The parish priest would pray over you. They would talk to you, obviously, so they pray over you. And the parish priest would be able to know if it's a strong case. Sometimes they're just weak demons that a parish priest can drive out through the sacrament of confession or just by praying over them, the priestly prayer and blessing can drive out a weak demon. Now, if it's a strong demon or there's many demons and the parish priest after confession and giving you spiritual direction, you're coming to Mass and praying, if the manifestations are so strong and the torments are strong, then every pastor of every parish knows who the exorcist in the diocese, they would call him up and they would send you to him. So any Catholic would get to the, to the exorcist through the parish priest. The parish priest is like the general surgeon. He would make the first determination by counseling, spiritual direction, and prayers. He would make the determination uh, if there's a diabolical <coughs> affliction here. And the surgeon, the, 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 the exorcist of the diocese, they're like the specialist. They're like the cancer specialist. You, First, when you got cancer, you first go to your doctor, and then your doctor says, yeah, I think there's something there. You know, you get your PSA is high, this, that, and the other. And let's do these tests, and then you need to go to an, an, an what's it called, oncologist? Yeah. They're, they're, so that's the way it is in every diocese. Every Catholic priest in the parishes, the, the priest, they're the general surgeon. That's who somebody would go to if they feel they have spiritual affliction. And then if the priest, the general surgeon, say, there's something here that's a lot stronger than uh, we even thought, or it's above my pay grade, then they would refer you to the exorcist. Another question? Yes. Um, does Satan ever go in someone, or is it just demons? Satan does too. Uh, rarely, but he does. I know a lot of exorcists that told me that, that you can tell when Satan possesses a human being, because unlike any other demon in hell, when Satan enters the body of a person, every priest has told me when they walk into a room and the, and the, the patient or the penitent is possessed by Satan himself, which is rare, but when he does possess, they say you walk into anywhere and it's, it's cold. It's like walking into a refrigerator. So every exorcist has told me when it's actually Satan himself, which is the chief, he's the CEO of all the demons, the most powerful one, 
you'll walk into the location to do the to do the session of prayer, and it's very cold. So that's uh, <coughs> and, and and when it's Satan himself, that's probably the most difficult demon to drive out. Demons have a they're like a, they're like the military. They have a rank structure. There's nine ranks from one to nine, from lower to higher. So you got superior demons and inferior demons. And, and they're pure evil. They're never going to repent. Yeah, they don't ever try to say, well, let's bring them up. This demon's conversion. Okay? Yeah, right. They're not going to change. They're pure evil. They're, they're, they're will, <laughs> their will is completely conformed to evil. And uh, and their only mission in life, they're like sharks. They're like serial spiritual predators. All they do is hunt. They don't sleep. They don't get tired. They don't eat. They don't drink. They don't take naps. They don't work eight hours a day and clock out. They don't take vacations on the weekends. They don't you know, they, they have barbecues. All they do is prowl the earth like hunts for predators and tempt people and try to take people to hell. Why do they do that? Because all the demons know that at the end of time when Christ comes back, Christ will gather all the demons by force and he will lock them all up in hell and seal hell and torment the demons forever. So the demons are trying to populate hell before the second coming of Christ because in hell... The demons are going to be the torturers, and the human souls are going to be the, the tortured. And so they're trying to recruit as many people as possible for their for their final playground, where they're going to reign supreme. Okay, let's pray. I can't do Revelation chapter.